Hello, I'm Jenny Stillman. I'd like to recite the eighth principle and then describe one key word or phrase. We, the members of the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of the Hudson Valley, covenant to affirm and promote journeying towards spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other forms of oppressions in ourselves and our institutions. Today's key phrase is accountably. Our existing seven principles imply this eighth principle, but do not explicitly hold us accountable for addressing these oppressing oppressions directly, especially at the systemic level. The proposed eighth principle has something the others do not, and that is the word accountably and the moral power it carries. We are called to be accountable to each other and to people belonging to oppressed groups, and we are accountable for our actions, past, present, and future. Good morning, Unitarian Universalist Congregation of the Hudson Valley. I am coming to you this morning from the sanctuary here at Community UU of White Plains. It is one of the odd things about these present circumstances that I'm at my congregation, but I'm not talking to my congregation. They are all in their homes as you are in yours. They are listening, they are worshiping together with a service that's coming neither from this congregation nor from yours, but from somewhere in the cloud or outer space. I don't know where it's coming from. Um, it has been now one year since we stopped worshiping together in person. For a year, the Unitarian Universalists of Croton and Environs, like the UUs of White Plains, have not sung together, hugged one another in greeting, shared coffee after a service, or had parking lot meetings. A poem by Unitarian Universalist Minister Lynn Unger was a very popular reading at our services during the first weeks of the pandemic. And so on this anniversary, I return to Reverend Unger's words, pandemic. What if you thought of it as the Jews consider the Sabbath the most sacred of times? Cease from travel. Cease from buying and selling. Give up, just for now, on trying to make the world different than it is. Sing, pray, touch only those to whom you commit your life. Center down. And when your body has become still, reach out with your heart. Know that we are connected in ways that are terrifying and beautiful. You could hardly deny it now. Know that our lives are in one another's hands. Surely that has come clear. Do not reach out your hands, reach out your heart, reach out your words, reach out all the tendrils of compassion that move invisibly where we cannot touch. Promise this world your love, for better or for worse, in sickness and in health, so long as we all shall live. There is a proposal that the Unitarian Universalist Association add a principle to its existing seven. The proposed eighth principle reads, we, the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association, covenant to affirm and promote journeying towards spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and in our institutions. The Eighth Principle website explains the origins of the idea. 
Paul Call Jones, when she was director of racial and social justice of the Joseph Priestley district, developed the idea of the existence of two different paradigms in UU circles, the UU seven principles and beloved community. She realized that a person can believe they're being a good UU and following the seven principles without thinking about or dealing with racism and other oppressions at the systemic level. Realizing that an eighth principle was needed to correct this, she talked with Bruce Pollock Johnson about some of the components that should be in it. Bruce's initial draft in 2013 was refined with a group of anti-racist activists in the district. UUs and the UUA have done very good work in fighting racism, such as during the civil rights movement and in the 1990s, but the funding and support waned in the 2000s. For people identified as white, it is too easy to ignore these issues, which is exactly what keeps the system of racism in our society alive and in fact worsening right now. We need to decenter whiteness and other dominant cultures in UUism. The eighth principle came from a feeling that we need something to renew our commitment to this work, to hold ourselves accountable and to fulfill the potential of our existing principles. Journeying toward spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse multicultural beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and our institutions. As I think you might recognize, that's the proposed eighth principle proposed to be added to the seven other principles that we, the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association covenant to affirm and promote. I suspect many of you recognize it because I understand you've been doing some work on this. I saw the beautiful video you have on the homepage of your congregation's website, the Black Lives Matter virtual art show. Your homepage also highlights that the eighth principle proposal, and, and it mentions that you have an eighth principle task force. You're having video segments like the one we heard from Jenny Stillman earlier by your members about the eighth principle. Excellent. Your UU neighbors here in White Plains engaged a similar process and we adopted the eighth principle as a principle of our congregation by a congregation vote at a special congregational meeting one month ago on Valentine's Day, February 14. I'm proud of my congregation for doing this work and I'm proud of you, our neighbors and indeed our siblings in liberal religion for doing it. Good on you. I don't think you need me to tell you that white supremacist assumptions are shot through our society. It's not just fringy groups that identify explicitly as white supremacist. The tacit feeling that it's better to be white infiltrates the minds and hearts of everyone who grows up in this country of whatever race. White supremacy is in all our bones. When the African-American scholar and activist Cornel West gave the Ware Lecture at the 2015 Unitarian Universalist General Assembly in Portland, Oregon, he told us, I've got a lot of vanilla brothers and sisters that walk with me and say, Brother West, Brother West, you know, I'm not a racist any longer. Grandma's got work to do, but I've transcended that. And I say to them, I'm a a Jesus loving free black man and I've tried to be so for 55 years and I'm 62 now. And when I look in the depths of my soul, I see white supremacy because I grew up in America. And if there's white supremacy in me, my hunch is you've got some work to do too." End quote. You know that. And I think you know the ways that this tacit notion that white is better plays out in concrete suffering for people of color. People of color are disproportionately subjected to police violence, citizen violence. They are charged more for housing or told that housing isn't available when white families are shown a plethora of options. Schools in neighborhoods of predominantly people of color are systemically underfunded. 
the chronic low-level stress with the awareness that at any moment could turn into acute high-level stress manifests in lower birth weight babies born to women of color even among economically advantaged, well-to-do women who follow all the prenatal care protocols. We are a long way from a diverse, multicultural, beloved community that has dismantled racism and other oppressions, but not so far that we can't imagine it. And guided by that vision, we can work to build it, for we recognize that the work itself is our journey towards spiritual wholeness. And I believe you understand that. So what I want to talk about this morning is what this means for the Unitarian Universalist path, how this plays out within the context of the people that we Unitarian Universalists are. Maybe you're down with anti-racism, but aren't entirely comfortable with mucking about with our sacred principles. What does it really mean for us that we are a people that have these principles, seven of them for now? Do principles change? Can they? Folks, we are Unitarian Universalists. We are a people of passion and intelligence, of moral imagination and creativity and engagement. We are a people not of creed. We are creedless. In this regard, we are not unique. We have this much in common with, oddly enough, the Southern Baptist Convention, which is officially creedless, as is the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. We go a little further in declaring not only that we have no creed, but that for us, religion itself is not about what one believes. Beliefs are an incidental, peripheral, and ultimately unnecessary aspect of religion, of spirituality. For us, religion is about three things. Religion is about how you live, the ethics and values that guide your life. Religion is about, second, community, the people you come together with and share rituals and affirm your community connection. And third, religion is about experience of a certain kind the experience of awe and wonder, the experience of mystery, transcendence, oneness, the experience of simultaneous intimacy and ultimacy. Believing, holding certain declarative sentences to be true, may be a part of one's approach to religion, but it is optional. What is essential are moral values, community, and direct experience of transcending mystery and wonder. We are not a people of creed. We are also not a people of canon. For all the words and writings offering insights, telling the story of who we are as a people, of how reality is, powerful words of wisdom and inspiration, we do not select a few of them to designate as our holy scripture, while all else is at best supplement or commentary or else entirely secular. Jews have a canon. It's the 39 books of the Tanakh, what Christians call the Old Testament, and especially the five books of the Torah. Catholics have a canon. It's those 39 plus the 27 books called the New Testament plus seven more Old Testament books for a total of 73. The Orthodox have a canon. They add six more books to the Catholic canon for a total of 79. And when the Protestants came along, they paired back to just 66 books, the 39 books of the Hebrew Bible plus the 27 books of the New Testament. But Unitarian Universalists are canonless in addition to creedless. We look to all the world's traditions for wisdom and insight and are ever open to new work that we may find limbs the ineffable or reaches for what cannot be grasped. This more radically separates us from other Western faith traditions than our vaunted eschewal of creed. We are a people neither of creed nor of canon, but of covenant. We are bound 
and bound together, not by common belief nor by a common scripture of study, but by a common promise. Covenant, in the religious sense, is not like a contract where one party doesn't live up to their part. If that happens, the other side doesn't have to live up to theirs. To live the way of covenant is to be constantly breaking it, to be constantly failing, and to be constantly called back or called forward to the promise of our promise. The Sufi mystic Rumi expressed this in a poem well known to us in its Coleman Barks translation, come, come, whoever you are, wanderer, worshiper, lover of leaving, it doesn't matter. Ours is not a caravan of despair. Come. These are the words of one of our hymns in our hymnal, but it's not the full poem. The rest of Rumi's poem adds, come even if you have broken your vows a thousand times, come yet again, come. The covenant continues to call and to compel, to beckon us toward the promise of a life constituted by promising, no matter how many times we have broken or will break our vow. And also, unlike a contract, which might lead the parties into court where a judge will render a ruling on what the contract's terms mean and whether the party's actions satisfy the terms, you alone are final arbiter of what the covenant requires of you now though we are each properly informed in this by our community and its collective discernments. And what is our covenant? What is it we promise, this promise that binds us, that fashions us into a people? I could tell you that it is right there in our principles set forth in the bylaws of the association. We, the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association covenant to affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person, justice, equity, and compassion in our relations, acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth in our congregations, a free and responsible search for truth and meaning, the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process within our congregations and in society at large, the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all, and respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. I could tell you that is our covenant, and that would be true. It is. Those are words that call to us as Unitarian Universalists, words that we experience in proportion to the size that faith has in our lives as compelling and beckoning promises that we fail to live up to and that we orient our lives by. They are the vows that point our way howsoever we stray. It's true, this is our covenant, but it's not the whole truth of the people we are. The words of the mission of this congregation are also covenantal. You all recited them just a little earlier. Inspired by love, our mission is to seek our true nature, connect openly and deeply, and act for justice. You are in covenant together to help each other carry out that mission which the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of the Hudson Valley adopted in 2014. And that's also an expression of, of the covenant. And you have a text that you call your congregational covenant that you adopted in 2018. Listen actively and respectfully, seek full and equitable participation, assume positive intent among other things. That's also an expression of covenant. But you were a congregation held by covenant long before 2018 when you adopted your current covenant statement and long before 2014 when you adopted your mission. Unitarian Universalists have been a people of covenant from long before 1985 when we adopted our current set of principles. And before that, the covenant was expressed along similar lines in 1961 in the initial documents when the Unitarian Universal Association was created from the consolidation of the Unitarians and the Universalists. Before that, 
both Unitarians and Universalists had expressed the covenant in various ways. In the late 19th century, for instance, James Blake expressed it in words that are still in our hymnal today. Love is the spirit of this church and service its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love and to help one another. The expression of the covenant is not the covenant. The expression of the covenant is some set of words. The covenant itself is the mysterious force that holds us together and is ultimately beyond words. The covenant of love, of fidelity to one another, the sacred promise to walk together. That's the bit that is eternal, that is outside of time. The ways we give expression to that eternal must fit the particular culture and time. The idea that every generation should give its own expression to our covenant was with us in 1961, when Unitarians and Universalists came together to form the Unitarian Universalist Association. And so one generation later, 1985, we revised the 1961 principles. Another generation brought us to the mid-aughts, the first decade of the 21st century. So it was time to review and revise again. And we engaged a process to do that. For two years, our congregations were enjoined to discuss possible revisions to our Article II bylaws, which includes the principles, and to submit ideas to the Commission on Appraisal. I remember that during those years, leading classes and meetings that, that, that were going on at the congregations I was serving at that time. And so the Commission on Appraisal received the input, produced a proposed revision, which came before the General Assembly in 2009 in Salt Lake City for initial approval. Initial approval would have sent the proposal to the congregations for a year of discussion. Finally, Final approval subject to vote of the 2010 General Assembly. The proposed changes in the principles themselves were slight. There would still be seven of them. The third principle would be shortened from acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth in our congregations to simply acceptance of one another and encouragement of spiritual growth. The fifth principle was similarly shortened from the right of conscience and use of democratic process within our congregations and in society at large to simply the right of conscience and the use of democratic processes. The seventh principle was changed from respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part to reverence for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. The other four principles were not changed at all. The proposed changes to the sources section was much greater. It would have replaced our six sources with three descriptive and rather prosaic paragraphs. And the proposal added a paragraph after the principles and then added a section on inclusion that said, systems of power, privilege, and oppression have traditionally created barriers for persons and groups with particular identities, ages, abilities, and histories. We pledge to do all that we can to replace such barriers with ever-widening circles of solidarity and mutual respect. We strive to be an association of congregations that truly welcome all persons and commit to structuring congregational and associational life in ways that empower and enhance everyone's participation. This was a fuller expression of commitments to anti-racism and multiculturalism than the existing section on anti-discrimination that this would replace. I was there in Salt Lake City, 2009, when moderator Ginny Corter called for the vote on the Article II bylaws change and the yellow voting cards were held aloft by those in favor and then by those opposed to the proposed revision. It looked like exactly the same number on each side. So she called again for the pro to raise their voting cards. And this time the General Assembly counters systematically went down the rows tallying the votes. And then the same was done for the con. 
And when the final tally was in, 573 delegates had voted to approve and send the proposal to the congregations. And 586 voted not to. I voted for the revisions, but the stronger feelings in the room tended to be on the con side. And most of it was related to the change in the sources. The new section on inclusion was generally supported, but our rules didn't allow us to vote on the parts separately. It had to be voted up or down as a whole. And as it happened, it was voted down. Today, the process of considering changes is again before the denomination. The covenant is eternal. The expression of the covenant is language that's responsive to the times, journeying towards spiritual wholeness. How? How do we do that? By working to build a beloved community. Well, what kind of beloved community? A diverse, multicultural beloved community. And how shall we do that? by our actions, actions that do what? Actions that dismantle racism and other oppressions. But you can't do that without accountability, right? Actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions. And where is this racism and the other oppressions we're going to accountably dismantle? It's in ourselves and our institutions. So let us say, say out loud and say officially that the call of covenant, the call to live bound and bound together by promise includes that we promise to affirm and promote journeying towards spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and our institutions. May it be so. Amen. And now for those of you who see God, may God be with you. For those who embrace life, may life return your affection. And for those who seek a better path, may the way be found and the courage to take it step by step. Go in peace. Before we exit to our uh, various coffee, co